someone howling at me. Who was that? <laughs> Who was that? Sarah. Hey, Sarah. That's what I'm talking about. It feels good to get howled at. <laughs> but any Stevie Wonder fans in the house? What? Okay. My favorite love song is Stevie Wonder, as also known as Always. If you're into it, we could sing it together after. <laughs> I saw some really cool love songs, too. So uh, thank y'all for leaning into the activity. I saw someone at the table like, I have to pick one? I'm like, you can write seven on there if you want to. Um, so good morning. good morning. Yes, people who say it back. I love that. Uh, thank you for being here today. And, and Rita and the whole Creative Mornings crew, thank you for having me. Uh, we're going to talk about eight lessons in love today. And before we begin, I want to dedicate this conversation to Philando Castile, Alton Sterling, and the 148 black lives that were unapologetically taken this year by a system designed to erase them. Every day I dream of a love in this world that flows so deep that no act could erase it, that no act could take it away, that no type of floating would make us assume their lives don't matter. And I believe that each of us in this room has the capacity to create that world, to inject love. And not just for black lives, for women's lives, for LGBTQIA lives, for children's lives, for marginalized groups around the world, for every single life in this room, and beyond. Now, when I talk about love, and I know it's this, this big sexy word that kind of floats around, and it's like, what the hell does love even mean, right? Um, I'm not talking about the noun. I am referring to the verb, the action, the kind of love that gets in formation and shows up with so much courage, so much empathy, so much compassion, so much understanding, so much joy that no matter how dark things get, it fights its way through to the love on the other side to the light on the other side. Are y'all cool with talking about that kind of love today? Yeah. OK, cool. I'm in the right place. I'm in the right place. So if you are ready to talk about that love, by a show of hands, who is ready for a love revolution? OK. What was that in the back? That's what I'm talking about. OK. You're all ready and good because the acts of love that we commit to now are more important than they've ever been. Um, I know you all know we're in the midst of some dark times. And today I'll share with you eight of the most important lessons I've learned as a human being in this world looking to instigate change. And I lean on these lessons each and every day as a reminder to choose love like my life depends on it. Because quite frankly, with our history right now, it, it truly does. So we'll begin with the first lesson. Honor your past. By a show of hands, who really loves the past that they've had? I see about one and a half hands. I see some shrunken hands. <laughs> I wish I could stand before you and tell you that I grew up in a loving family with hugs and love and a poodle and all those great things. But to be completely honest, um, pain and trauma taught me all that I know about love. And I grew up in New York City, born and raised in the 80s, in the crack era. And it's something that we hear about in rap songs. We, we see it on TV. But for me, growing up in the crack era in the 80s was a front row seat to what darkness looks like. And both of my parents struggled with drug addiction. My father was addicted to crack. My mother was addicted to cocaine and alcohol. And I literally watched them fight for their lives every day. And in doing that, it really showed me something. Um, it showed me that the opposite of darkness is light and love. And though there were moments where they were not present, um, I really had to learn how to navigate New York City and learn all of these lessons on my own. But fortunately, uh, there were nice little glimmers of hope. Growing up in Harlem is like the mecca of excellence. I'm very proud to have been from there. But the things that I saw growing up in poverty with my siblings were families who really cared about each other, communities who would go out of their way to be present for each other. And I saw that kind of love. And I knew that, OK, there's darkness. There's, there's also light. So within my past, I learned about choice. And I chose that every day I would rise up and fight for love like hell. And the bond that I have with my siblings is what kept us going. 
love kept us alive. And so I know oftentimes we're really haunted by our past. They're traumatizing. Um, and they can really shift the way that we operate in the world. But the greatest lesson I've learned through that process is that your past grooms you for your purpose. Every hardship I experienced, every challenge that I faced, is a skill that I learned that I apply as an adult. And I'm like, oh, I've been through that already. I've, I've been there. I've felt that pain. Um, and it caused me to really learn how to face my pain. So lesson one is honor your past. The second lesson is cultivate empathy. We, we hear about the word empathy often. And in my learning and growing up in Harlem with parents challenged with drug addictions, I really learned how to listen. And I think the three most important pieces of empathy are listen and teach, listen and teach, help, and communicate. So I grew up a really, really shy, introverted kid. I was afraid of my own shadow. I called my sister this morning and I was like, what was I like as a kid? And she's like, you were annoying and uh, you were angry and you were always observing and always listening. And I was like, why was I so angry? And she said, like, you were disappointed because you were looking for love from our parents that wasn't there. And I just kind of sat with that for a minute, like, man. And I learned that that experience made me actually a lot more understanding and empathetic to what other people were experiencing and what other people were feeling. And what I didn't know at the time was that that empathy was giving me all the skills to harness that I'd need to fulfill my purpose on my journey. So I literally listened constantly. I love to listen to people's stories, and people were not shy. I'm sure if there are any introverts in the room, you can attest to the fact that people kind of just walk up to you and tell you stuff all the time. Complete strangers, um, sometimes friends. They're just like, you look like, you look like you would be there for me. Um, and I learned through empathy how to show up for people. And it became really important to me to give the love that I hadn't received. So cultivate empathy was my second lesson. Um, and it's something that I carry with me in all things. And if we are going to change the world, we have to be open to the perspectives of what other people are going through, whether, you, whether you've experienced it firsthand or not. So in cultivating empathy, I learned something really, really important. Find your jam. Z. <laughs> you might have more than one jam, and we'll talk about that. I think it's really interesting how sometimes society challenges us to focus on one thing. Like, you can only do one thing really well and, like, pick one interest. And I'm like, no, I don't want to pick one thing. Um, because I think the culmination of all your skills and all your likes and all your loves and all your interests make you who you are. And more importantly, they equip you to be prepared for what you're here to do. So in Finding My Jam, it was all about staying curious. And as a kid who was always trying to be out of the house, I didn't want to be home a lot. It wasn't a healthy space for me. And I'm like, I'm going to seek out joy and light and love people and serve. And I've, I've always felt that I'm at my best when I'm serving. Um, and so I'm finding my jams. I landed on three things that I'm super, super passionate about. Education, music, hence the prompt this morning, and food. And I'm sure we can all get down with food. And the reason why I really gravitated to those things is because as I observed, I realized these are the three connectors that no matter where we're from, no matter what our differences are, they're the catalysts that bring us together. I love to break bread with people. I love to share favorite songs with people. When Jaime had a TLC song on his name tag, I was like, yes, Red Light Special, that's my jam. <laughs> Shout out to you, Jaime. And education, right? The, the learning that we do, there's, there's, there's power in knowledge. There's, there's power in learning new things. And beyond anything else in education, it put me in a position to always be learning. I'm never not learning. And so with those three passions, I was like, how do I explore these things and, and do different things in the world? And I just kept diving deeper into things that filled me up, things that made me feel really good. And I encourage you all to find your jams if you, if you haven't already. Um, and the key to finding my jam to me was just staying curious, kept blazing the path and blazing the trail. And what I realized along my journey as a really shy, introverted kid is that life kept putting me in these positions where I had to speak up. And I'm like, damn, but I don't want to talk. I don't want to share. Um, but I realized that my voice mattered. And it was a really defining moment for me on my journey in high school. Um, I was the captain of my basketball team. And somehow, I ended up being the captain of my debate team. And I really fell in love with the art of communication. I think the purest form of love is the way we communicate with each other. I think communication leads to understanding, and that leads to change. A lot of our disagreements in the world is because we never took the time out to listen and understand where people were coming from. So with my debate skills and my basketball knowledge, um, I was a terrible student. 
I didn't show up in class. I, I knew the work was easy and I didn't feel challenged. And so my idea of sticking it to the man was not doing the work. And I realized in hindsight, that's not the way to do it. Um, but I was in a really defining moment in my senior year in high school. And I was involved in a grade changing scandal. And so the way the story goes is I failed economics, still not the biggest fan of the course economics, uh, but I had a conversation with my coach, with my principal, and with my assistant coach and economics teacher. And my principal gathered us together and he said, change the grade. And I was the only one in the room who was like, maybe we shouldn't do this. Perhaps we can, there's a couple more classes coming up in the new semester. I'll be fine, I'll pass, we'll move forward. Um, but my principal insisted and he changed the grade and we went on to play. We were like 13 and 0 my senior year. I'm like, this is gonna be the championship moment. This is the year it's going down. And we got a call a couple weeks later that someone had informed our athletic league that we had a player playing ineligibly. And so every game that I played in eligibly, we had to forfeit, and we missed the playoffs by one slot. And I was devastated, like, damn. The choices you make on the road defining your jams are choices and consequences that you have to live with. And so an interesting opportunity came up. I got a call a couple weeks later from the New York Daily News. And they said, you know, your coach informed us about what happened. We're writing a story about it. Do you want to share your story? And I was like, I deferred to my mom at the time. And the interesting thing about my mom is that while she was challenged with addiction, she always really pushed me to push it to the limit. She's like, speak up for yourself. If you want to do this, I'll support you. And so we did. And I shared the story. And I didn't know it was going to be a big story, but it ended up being on the front page of the newspaper, like two weeks shy of my high school graduation. And I was like, what is happening right now? Um, what is this? But it showed me something really interesting. And in finding your jam and exploring your curiosity, you learn where the holes are, where the gaps are, what the broken things are, and how you might be able to contribute to those spaces. So in that moment as a high school student, I really understood the importance of my voice and what I could do with it. Um, and I also realized that the skills that I had learned to be able to share that story is not what we traditionally learn in school at all. No one teaches us how to speak up for ourselves necessarily or how to communicate an idea, how to convey a thought, how to really champion for yourself. Um, and so in that moment, I realized that was a big need. And it was also something really interesting I learned. Permission. Snaps for that. Yes, thank you. <laughs> There's something interesting that we learn growing up. It's like you always have to ask. You always have to do as you're told. You always have to. And I'm like, love doesn't need permission. And we damn sure don't need permission to change the world. So along that journey after high school, I ended up going to college and studying television and radio. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get a full basketball scholarship. And through that journey, I just kept exploring the things that I was really, really excited about and really interested in. And I'm telling you, when I graduated high school at the time, I thought boys with braces were cute. So I'm like, I'm going to be a dentist. And that was where the journey started. And it shifted a lot. It shifted a lot. And I never asked for permission about what I wanted to do. I just dreamt the dream and I, and I went for it. Um, so fortunately, I didn't end up going the, the path of a dentist. I don't think that that was the right space for me. Um, but I did explore a number of things in college. And I found a number of different gaps and spaces that I was in. And one of the biggest holes I saw was in education. And this was after, in college, I'd studied television and radio, and I hosted my own radio show for a few years, and I really enjoyed using my voice as a vessel to share stories, uh, to interview new people, to meet new people, and it just didn't feel like enough anymore. It didn't fill me up. I've noticed that in, in the work that I've done, if, it doesn't, if I don't love it, I can't really be fully present for it. And I'm sure some of you all can attest to that. And sometimes we're taught, like, just stay, just stick around. And it's like, why would you be in pain for work that doesn't fill your cup? Um, it didn't make sense to me. So I just stopped asking for permission for things. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do whatever the hell I want to do. And I explored. I worked at an accounting firm. Um, I spent four years working at a contracting firm doing project management. I learned all the skills I would need to learn to run my own business. And at the time, if you would have asked me 10 years ago, there's no way I would say, yes, I want to run my own company and be the boss of people. I just, this concept of being a boss wasn't something I was interested in. And I finally got to a breaking point in work where I was like, I just can't 
do this nine to five thing anymore. This doesn't feel good to me. Um, I need to be out in the world. I need to be contributing in a, in a meaningful way. And I learned the most important lesson, leap. I am all about the leaps. I think that I've, I have really long legs for a reason. I'm starting to believe that like, even down to my body type, this is all, all about you know, a purpose. And before one of my biggest leaps, I found out that my oldest niece had a learning disability and it broke my heart. A lot of my intentions and my, my decisions in life have been, interestingly enough, motivated by heartbreak. The pain you feel in your heart when you're like, damn, this isn't right, this doesn't feel good. What am I gonna do about it? All of my leaps have been a process of asking myself, what am I gonna do about it? Because we have the capacity to do something. So my first leap, and it was a, a ballsy leap, I decided that because my niece had a learning disability, it was time for me to transition from my work into radio and transition into education. And I was like, what am I gonna do? So I put an ad on Craigslist, and I was like, does anyone need a tutor for their children? I will tutor your children. I was like, what am I doing? I don't know. <laughs> and um, like 15 people responded. And I was like, all right, cool. I guess I'm a tutor now. This is it. This is, <laughs> this is how we're going to kick this off. I'm, and I started tutoring students. And I fell in love with the process of teaching, um, but also everything I learned from people I was teaching. I think you know, in order to be a teacher, you've got to be a student first. And I worked with students who had learning disabilities. I remember working with an eighth grade student who loved comics so much, and he was in a special education class, and he was reading on a third grade level. And I taught him how to read using comic books. And just to see the transformation in him was like, whoa, this is amazing. And to see his mom cry when she heard him read the first time was like, Whew, education is love. And through that leap, I was like, what else about my public school training didn't really groom me and ready me for the world? And I started to think, I'm like, you know, no one taught us to dream. No one taught us it's OK to carve our own path, to blaze our own trail. And I was like, I'm gonna, let's go to some schools and start doing that. And so I talked to a friend of mine, Science. And he, at the time, had put out a mixtape called The Hall Pass. And all of the songs on the mixtape corresponded with the subject. So there was recess, crowd favorite. There was mathematics. <laughs> There was like astronomy, and I was like, you know, it would be dope if we went into schools and performed these songs and told students that it's okay to live your dreams and pursue them and blaze your own trail. And he was like, dope, I'm down. And I was like, okay. The interesting thing about when you have an idea and people say yes, it's like, you actually have to do that idea. <laughs> and I think the most powerful thing about LEAP is you have to create something. You have to do the work. There is no substitute for doing the work. And it's really an easy, it's not easy. It's really a simple decision. It's not easy. It will be hard sometimes, but it is a very simple decision to choose. So science was down. I was like, OK, I can host the concerts. You're going to rap. We have a portion of this vision. And literally two days later, one of my best friends and my business partner, Janelle, called me. She was like, you'll never believe what just happened. I just performed for 300 middle school students at Ticonderoga Middle School. I told them about my journey. I sung for them. They went nuts. And I was like, no way. Guess what I just talked to science about? And she was like, what? And she was down. So then we had a headlining singer, and we had a headlining MC. And I was like, let's call this. We decided we'd call it the Hall Pass Tour. And the intent was we'd travel around the country to different schools and produce concerts themed around getting them excited about using higher learning to pursue their dreams. And when we talked about higher learning, it was like creating your own path of higher learning. And so we got a DJ, DJ Kraft. And we just called on all of our homies, like, are you down for this? And they're like, we're down. And I started cold calling schools at first. And then we met an organization who was like, we have a network of 500 schools. Pick where you want to go and do it. And I'm like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I have to do this now. We have to do this now. Um, and there's something really powerful when you have a vision in your mind. Sometimes your dreams will plant idea seeds so deep that you just can't ignore it anymore. I'm sure some of you dream of ideas and you have visions and you're like, I have to do this. Um, and it kept thrusting us forward. And so we started the tour. And I believe that sometimes you've got to fail spectacularly in the process of breaking the rules. And so we did. Our first concert was at a middle school in New York City. Big crowd of about 150 students and their families. And the intent was not just to hold a concert, but to have students be the opening acts. So in stepping on stage and sharing what they dream about, what they're passionate about, what they love, it planted a seed for other students to know they could do the same. 
Now, when they got off the stage, it's like, what do you do? Now you get together as a school and figure out how do you create space for your students to have access to the things they said they're passionate about. So it's really an opportunity to spark school change by igniting students to really tap into their agency and be leaders. And our first five concerts were in New York City. The second concert, there were about seven and a half people there. I say half because it was maybe someone who was like under two. <laughs> it was the emptiest, most hollow space we ever had been in. And it was a really pivotal lesson for us in learning that sometimes people don't value free. So we were like, we're going to throw all these concerts for free, and people will show up, and they'll be on it. And it's like, OK, that's actually not how the world works in that leap. So we fine-tuned things a little bit, and we figured out a method where schools would pay a portion, and a sponsor would pay the other portion. It's like when you've invested money into something for yourself, you're going to show up for it, or hopefully. Um, sometimes it doesn't work out that way. So five concerts turned into about 25 concerts. We got featured in Fast Company. Uh, we got featured in Good Magazine. And we traveled around the country to about 11 states. We rocked with like 20,000 students, all in the name of producing concerts themed around getting kids excited about living out their dreams. And I realized, I'm like, that's my jam, activating people to live their best life and do what they love with love. That filled me up. And an interesting second leap happened through the Hall Pass tour. I realized I really like hosting things, and that's fun. But the more important piece for me was really coaching students to hold space on stage. Hearing students declare what they wanted, what they dreamed of, what they loved was so fulfilling. I was like, I need to do more of that. And are you familiar with Skillshare? All right. So at the time, Skillshare was this platform where you could teach um, in-person classes locally. So anyone can teach anything. And I believe that if you're not adding to the world, you're subtracting. So we all have to add value some type of way. So I rallied up like six of my friends, and we went and took a class called How to Teach a Skillshare class. And we're in there, and I'm like, you all have a very unique skill that you can teach. What are you going to do? One friend was like HR. One friend was like finance. And I, I was in the space. Like, I was like, what am I going to teach? And one of my homegirls was like, public speaking. And I was like, I never really thought about that. I was like, let's go with that. Let's go with that. So I developed a workshop called Cool as a Cucumber, How to Master Public Speaking. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it was like $10. I didn't know what I was doing. I was like, I know I can teach. I know I can put a workshop together. And I realized that there were so many people my age and beyond who really had powerful ideas, profound ideas, but they didn't necessarily have the skill set or the confidence to share them. And what my work has become over time is really supporting people and finding the courage to speak from their heart. I genuinely believe that if we have more people and more faces who are confident enough to share those ideas, they'll rally tribes to do the work they need to do to change the world. And that really lit me up. So in 2012, I taught my first workshop. And there were about 10 people, about 70% of them were my friends. And it went really well. And then someone planted a seed for something else. And they were like, um, can you come teach this workshop at my company? And I was like, sure. And then that led to, can you coach me one-on-one? -on -one? And I was like, sure. And I was like, is this another business that's happening right now? And that became Oratory Glory. And it's a communication agency that I run with a collective of amazing people. And our focus is essentially on working with companies and students and schools and creatives who are really blazing a trail, a trail to build a better world. And that work falls along the lines of strategy, learning experiences, and coaching. And it fills my cup to be able to see people share what they do with love. So that was my next leap. The most interesting thing about leaping is that you can't do it all alone. And I had to begin to unpack a lot of the challenges and the trauma that I grew up in. Because when your parents aren't there for you in the way you need them to be, you begin to think you have to do it all yourself. And being exposed to darkness constantly had me battling with resilience and defeat. And I chose to show up. And for a long time, it was really hard for me to ask for help. And there's an African proverb that goes, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And so finding my tribe became really, really crucial for me. Finding a tribe of people who love the work they do and who are really about that life, as my friends would say, who are really about that life. 
And so with Hall Pass Tour, it was really recruiting the homies. We had a DJ, we had a headlining singer, we had a headlining MC, and we took to the world together. They were the most amazing times of my life being on the road with them. And with Oratory Glory, I had to do the same. I had to really reach out and talk to my friends like, this is the vision that I have. I want to mobilize the next generation to really change the world and to own their voices in the process. And so I told my friend Craig, and Craig was like, I'm on board, and Craig is here today. Shout out to you, Craig. I don't know where you're sitting. And then it became like a domino effect, right? I started writing down the things that I wanted to manifest. And every time I wrote them down and I spoke about them, they came to pass. I have a good friend who always says, you got to keep your dreams in conversation. Now, finding the right tribe is beyond just your work. I realized along the process that I love, so, so, I love people so much that I want to take everybody with me. And the most critical lesson I learned in finding your tribe is everybody can't come along for the ride. Everyone cannot come along for the ride. Um, some people aren't prepared. Some people are afraid. And sometimes you've got to move forward to fulfill your purpose, whether people are on board or not. So finding my tribe was critical. Um, and I'm super, super honored and humbled to be able to work with a team of nine within the Oratory Glory Collective who are so down. And, and finding my tribe, I'm like, I need to find people who can do stuff that I don't do. Um, I don't want to do finance. I don't want to do social media. I've become, as an introvert, very much a ninja. So I'm very selective about the things that I share. Um, and so I intentionally sought after people who would fill in the gaps for the things that I didn't do well. The toughest part about finding a tribe is surrendering. Does anyone here have trouble asking for help? <laughs> ah, I like that laugh. That's probably the good <laughs> It's like a Yelp kind of, yeah. <laughs> That's what it feels like, usually. So in surrendering, and this is the most important lesson that I learned in love, you can't move in love if you don't forgive. You can't move in love if you don't let go of the past. You can't move in love if you don't love yourself. And as we started to grow the business and the vision for Oratory Glory, and as I started to get clear about what I really want out of life, I had to surrender. I had to go back to all of the hurt and pain that I felt as a kid. And I realized I had to go back and forgive my parents. Damn, that was hard. It's still hard. Um, and I learned that forgiveness is actually an everyday thing. You have to choose to forgive every day. It's not like, all right, I forgive you today, and it, it lasts. This is, there's no such thing as a forgiveness band-aid. So I really had to dig deep um, and do a lot of soul searching and surrender to what was before me because I felt held back. I'm like, damn, I can't, why am I not growing? I'm like, because I'm holding on to so much that I've never talked about, that I've never let go of. And I remember calling my mom a couple weeks ago and I just, I'm a big crier. I'm, any criers in the house? Like, all right. <laughs> Crying is my form of purging. Um, and I remember calling my mom a couple weeks ago and I just was like, I love you so much. And I just, you know, the gasp in between when you're crying. <laughs> um, I just told my mom, I was like, I love you and I forgive you. And I understand that the challenges you were facing were just how you dealt with your pain. And I was like, I'm here. And I'm not going to let the past hold me hostage anymore. I was like, it's a daily challenge for me. And I was like, I know there's nothing that we can do to erase what happened in the past. I was like, but we can work on what's happening in the present. And there's something really interesting about living in the past. There's so many moments that pass you by because you're so caught up on something that you can never change. Um, and love lives in the now. And love endures through all things. So I surrendered to all the hurt, to all the pain, to all the discomfort, to all the feelings that I didn't want to face but I had to feel in order to heal. And that became a journey of self-love for me. And I was like, what's my practice? Because I'm like, I, I have this habit of uh, darkness teaches you how to fight like hell, and it teaches you how to hide. I got really, really good at hiding and deflecting. People would ask me about my story, and I'm like, I, I would always find a way to shift it back to them. And I had to get really comfortable talking about my story and my work and myself. Um, and I developed a practice for myself. I had to get really spiritually grounded, and I meditate now. Um, and I write down my feelings, and I talk about how I'm feeling, and I cry a lot um, because it's my form of purging and healing, and I know that unforgiveness stunts your growth. So I had to surrender. Um, and I'm always here for all the discomfort now and the uncomfortable questions. You've really got to lean in. And so in surrendering, I realized the next lesson, own your voice to leave your mark. 
And that's essentially the premise of oratory glory and where we're headed now. I was like, in order for us to get there, there's so much I have to let go of um, because I can't lead a team, I can't grow a team, my team can't feel empowered to do their best work if I'm still stuck in the past. And so I honor every moment as an opportunity to really own my voice and leave my mark in whatever it is that I'm doing. And what does it mean to own your voice and leave your mark, right? It means to speak up for whatever you believe in. It means to speak up for injustices that you know are wrong. It means to choose yourself, right? The concept of choosing myself was so foreign before. I'm like, no, I have to live in service of others. And it's like, how good are you at serving others if you don't serve yourself first? So I had to learn that lesson really, 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 really quickly. And it was really, really hard. And it's actually something that I'm still doing on a day-to-day -day basis today. And as I mentioned, it's become the focus of oratory glory. And the work that we do, we exist to help people own their voices to really leave their marks on the world. And super excited to be in the presence of folks like you to be able to do that very, very important work. And so the biggest lesson is that we choose, right? This, this idea of choice, of where we are, of where we're headed. Every day we wake up and we decide, we choose. You chose to come here today. You're choosing to go to work next, or maybe to just go to Dolores Park and hang out instead of going to work next. Um, but we choose how our past informs our future and what we'll do with all the beautiful moments in between. We choose which mountains we'll climb or which ones will attempt to carry. We choose how we'll respond to the injustices of the world and which ones we'll turn a blind eye to. But most importantly, we choose how we'll show up in the world, what contributions we'll make, what rules we'll break for the better. And with love as your compass, you'll always end up exactly where you belong, right in the midst of fulfilling your purpose. So I leave you all with three questions. How will you own your voice? Where will you inject love? And if you haven't already, when will you start? Because the world needs your light now more than ever. And there's no better time than this moment before us. Thank you. Thank you.